When I hear Walt Whitman, it's weird. I get irritated. And I've been trying to think for a long time about what it is about Walt Whitman I find irritating. And it's probably because he stands in such remarkable juxtaposition to Emily Dickinson. Um, and Dickinson is somebody that, you know, I've already expressed great admiration for. So, here comes Whitman. And Whitman's style of poetry, for me, is more akin to, like, epic. Um, his works explode off the page. And that's something that he used to keep keep in mind as he wrote. You'll find these incredibly long lines coming in with, I believe you would call an enjambment where like it flows into the next line and it's almost like what Whitman was trying to do was kind of play with the printing press a little bit. He liked to write lines that looked like they were breaking off of the page. Like he was just he was flirting with actually violating the typesetting. And this matches a lot of his personality extremely well. Whitman was in many ways a epic poet for America. And a lot of his poetry is based upon and predicated on the images of America in its um, pre and during Civil War age. And he was writing around all this, uh, this, this time frame. He flirts with a lot of transcendentalism and a lot of romanticism. As, you know, he looks upon the world and his surroundings and his senses as something that is almost, you know, to be intoxicated from. And rather than taking the, the controlled, sophisticated route of trying to encapsulate really complicated details with only a few phrases, Whitman goes in the opposite direction and throws everything he has at it. Um... It's annoying for me, but a lot of people really identify with this style much better. A lot of people feel that this is more poetic or somehow a greater accomplishment. And to be fair, Leaves of Grass, his main like piece de resistance, that book is huge, and it's a single poem. It's, it is pretty staggering how much stuff he put out there. Now, Whitman was a little bit of a rock star in his age. Um, and he was very well known, very well respected. Uh, he also was he cultivated an image of himself as a bit of a kind of vagabond, um, a, a drifter almost. Um, there have been a lot of rumors, and this is kind of running into a little bit of... Um, you know what? This is actually be a good time to kind of think about this. Let's, let's throw out another theory in case you haven't gotten started on the theory paper. Let's talk about queer theory. Queer theory seems to be an offshoot of feminism. Well, feminism uh, is constantly digging for the evidence of a kind of repressed female voice, right? The, it, where we are constantly um, subjugating the voice of women, not allowing it to be heard, or that we see a, the voice of women breaking out. There's been a long-standing rumor that Walt Whitman was homosexual. Now, was he? I don't think there's anything definitive. But a lot of people have taught Whitman and have highlighted some of the more homoerotic things that he talks about. Now, at the very least, you might be able to make an argument that he may have been bisexual. Uh, or it may not matter. Now, from a queer theory perspective, what we start to do is we adopt the same type of approach that the feminists do, except we look for the voices of homosexuality. Because, just like women, homosexuals have been massively repressed. People have not been able to openly express and explore their homosexuality because a society has traditionally placed so much stigma upon it. And it's only in the modern era that we've even begun to talk about this, um, that it's been able to be out and talked about in the public space. Here's the question, and this is something that might work really well for a discussion question. Does the sexual orientation of an author 
really matter that much in the grand scheme of things? It probably, well, it probably depends on who it is and what they were trying to talk about. Especially, I've made an, uh, the argument a couple of times that you see writing from people that are raging against sin. Right? Like, let's take Jonathan Edwards or Wigglesworth, for example. Wigglesworth was absolutely tormented. You can see that in the Day of Doom. Jonathan Edwards had some pretty horrifying skeletons in his closet because he almost seems to be engaging in a type of weird sadism um, with these hell images. Which is also kind of another one of the weird psychological things that you look back in the Middle Ages, you see images of hell, and... Like, this was middle age pornography. It was an excuse to, like, draw people naked and talk about naughty stuff. So, like, I've made the argument a couple of times from a queer theory perspective that when somebody is really, really harping on homosexuality and when somebody is really talking about how bad it is or it's a constant theme for them, it's worth exploring because a lot of times what you'll find is that when someone is obsessed with homosexuality, chances are it's probably because they're not talking about everyone else. They're talking about themselves. And they, when, you're, when you're obsessed with secret sin and when you're obsessed with the constant conformity of the will of God, it does kind of beg the question. For Whitman, I'm not necessarily certain it's so important. Whitman, when we read through a couple of Whitman's poems, what you'll find is, is a love for everything and an absolute romanticism for everything. Everything is worthy of praise. Everything is worthy of love. Everything is sensual. And basically, Whitman kind of gets drunk off of everything so that, you know, he kind of divorces the outright explicit sexuality of his affections. He divorces it from the orientation question. I can't believe that this video has kind of gone crazy with the queer theory stuff, but it is it is interesting um, that I, I really don't think it's necessary. Now, as we read through some of these poems, and if you want to go through and make an argument that it is necessary in an understanding of Whitman, that would be a really cool paper. And there are several authors that we'll talk about later who, that's a constant question is were there some complex things going on with their sexuality now i'm just going to read one poem for this video because i want to do the other two uh for a follow-up but uh let's talk about when i heard the learned astronomer when i first heard this poem and when i was uh, a young sprout of a literature person oh god i hated it <laughs> i hated it because it just it just seems so hokey to me it's a classic it's a classic. A lot of people really like this poem, so let's read it and get some impressions of it. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures, were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I was sitting, heard the... Wait, uh, oops. Ha, ha. When I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room. Notice the uh, the line break with lecture room. There's a little bit of that kind of printing press breaking. Um, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick. Oh my gosh, this lecture is so boring. I'm sure you guys never think that way when you're watching one of my videos. <laughs> Till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air. And from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. What happened here in moist? God, it's an ugly word. I can't claim, you know, originality on that by saying I've discovered the ugliness of moist. There's been a bunch of people who talk about moist as being like almost a vulgar word. It has like kind of weird, I don't know if this would be the case for Whitman in his day, but moist has some kind of ugh, almost sexual connotations to it or maybe Oh, God, I should get away from it. I hate that word. But that word is just awful. But at the same time, it's a very Whitman word. This the, he, he chooses words that are striking and are going to make you pause and kind of derail you a bit. Um, but what's happening is, is he's in a collegiate environment. He's listening to a lecture by a very well-known astronomer talking about the stars. He's talking about the charts, the diagrams, the adding, the division, the measuring. 
this is what astronomers often do, right? Astronomy isn't just about looking at the stars. It's about understanding their behavior. It's about predicting their behavior, tracking them, knowing how to locate things, and, like, you know, the study of what it is that's going on out there, right? But this in-depth and complex study is boring to Whitman. Now, again, this is also kind of what might be one of the things that I kind of get irritated about with him, because I like in-depth study, in case you guys haven't noticed. Um, I like in-depth study. I like knowing everything there is to know about something. And that, for me, that increases the majesty and the mystery of it. But what Whitman's trying to show us here is that for him, he goes out into the world, right? And he gets the totality of the experience. It is that moist air and the fact that he can just look up in silence and enjoy the stars as a spectacle. It's a very romantic, romanticist idea, almost transcendental, that it's like, you know, the, the emotional and the aesthetic beauty of the stars is worth respect in and of itself. Okay, it's a good poem, nah, but, yeah, I don't know. Argue me. Tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> Tell me why Whitman's better than Dickinson. And again, those are the types of things that we have to kind of think about when we write our papers. We have to kind of weigh people against each other. We have to play them against each other. And we have to come up with opinions on who we like and who we don't like and why. What are they really saying? Why do they suck? These are completely appropriate subjects to talk about as we start to get closer analysis of literature. More to come.